Hello everyone, here comes a review of our lecture on elasticity of demand. And as you might recall, elasticity of demand relates to, well, the law of demand. We know that as price goes up, quantity demanded tends to go down and the other way around. As price goes down, quantity demanded will go up, assuming that everything else stays the same. So that's the general observation that we know from our previous discussions. Today we're going to take a closer look at this relationship and look at elasticity of demand, which actually is a measure of responsiveness of quantity demanded to changes in price. So elasticity of demand measures responsiveness. of quantity demanded to changes in price. All right, so the way we are going to do that is to compare percentage changes in both variables. So we're going to relate to percentage changes in uh, quantity and price and then depending on which one is larger uh, we can figure out whether demand is elastic or inelastic so we're going to calculate percentage change in quantity and percentage change in price and then actually a meaningful way to compare them is to calculate the ratio and then depending on the size of this ratio we can conclude whether demand is elastic or inelastic so the ratio we're looking at in fact the absolute value of the ratio is the ratio of percentage change in quantity of two percentage change in price so if uh, this ratio happens to be larger than one well we know that uh, quantity demanded changes more than uh, the initial change in price so and we would say that demand is elastic in such a case because for a given change in price we have a fairly large increase in quantity so Simply put, if percentage change in quantity is larger than percentage change in price that actually initiated this change in quantity, we say demand is elastic. If the number we get here is actually smaller than one, well, we say that demand is inelastic. And if, if it happens to be exactly one, we say demand is unit elastic so the borderline is actually one and not zero uh, well next question is how exactly should we calculate those percentage changes and um, actually here uh, the way we calculate percentage change looks a bit different from what uh, you guys probably are used to well assuming you remember how to calculate percentage changes so if you have actually uh, two values for price two values for quantities right to consider a change so so we know that price is going to let's say increase or decrease doesn't matter change from p1 to p2 right and that will result in a change in quantity demanded from Q1 to Q2. So we have four values. How are we going to use them? Uh, so we're going to calculate percentage change in quantity. And um, how do you calculate percentage changes? Well, you first calculate the absolute change between two values, right? And then you usually divide it 
this difference by starting value. So if we were using the standard percentage change formula, we would have divided it by Q1. But here we're going to use something called the midpoint method, uh, which means we, that we're going to divide this difference by the average of, of both values. So Q1 plus Q2 divided by 2 is the average of Q1 and Q2. And so that's what we're going to use as a denominator. Then times 100 gives us the formula for percentage change in price. Pretty much the same thing, only now we're using P2 and P1. And again, we divide by the average of these two values. So it's neither starting nor ending value, but the average of those two, which kind of makes this formula sort of foolproof because uh, you don't have to worry which about which number comes first, whether it's P2 minus P1 or P1 minus uh, P2, and then you don't have to think about which value to put here. It's just the average of those two. All right, and uh, then after you got these two numbers, assuming you do your math with no errors, then you just divide one by the other using this formula. So when working on this kind of calculations, I always encourage you guys to first write down the formula. So percentage change in quantity over percentage change in price. Okay, and then do this and this. So in fact, write down, write down this formula and then plug in numbers as well, assuming of course you know them, you have them. Okay, just don't put numbers without formulas because that might work out, but it might not. Quite a bit of people actually flip this formula, so they divide percentage change in price by percentage change in quantity, and you won't make this mistake or will be less likely to make it if actually you have this formula in front of you. And if you wrote it down, it will help you to memorize it better. All right, so I've got a request in one of my classes to do numerical example. Well, I guess I can do it here real quick. And for that, in fact, I'm going to refer to the textbook. So um, depending on which edition you have, um, uh, it might be on a different page, but you should be able to find this diagram. Uh, so I'm just going to use numbers from this um, example real quick. So what do we have here? Uh, so we need to get P1 starting value and uh, ending value for price. So what I'm seeing here, starting value, so price drops, so it, no, price increases. So it goes from $3 to uh, $5. And quantity accordingly uh, drops from 15 units to uh, 5 units. All right, so the, war, uh, the law of demand in work because higher price results in smaller quantity demanded. All right, so based on these four numbers we can estimate elasticity so first of all let's remember the formula overall formula elasticity is a ratio actually absolute value over ratio of percentage change in quantity over percentage change in price so we're supposed to get these two numbers so let's do percentage change in quantity first uh, so the formula is Q2 minus Q1 divided by uh, the average Q1 plus Q2 divided by 2 times, well, 100. And so Q2 as we have here is 5. So in fact it will be a negative number because we have a decrease. 
minus 15 divided by 5 plus 15 divided by 2 times 100. Again, I mentioned in class that uh, you actually can skip 100, but I'm trying to be rigorous here, so I keep 100. So 5 minus 15 is what is minus 10, right? The average of 20, which is 5 plus 15, is 10. So looks like we're getting minus 1 or minus 100 percent. All right, percentage change in price. Again, write down the formula P2 minus P1 divided by P1 plus P2 divided by 2 times 100. So P1, actually P2 is 5, P1 is 3 divided by 5 plus 3 divided by 2 times 100. So it's 2 over... Uh, Four, right times 100 Actually, I forgot to multiply by 100 here so looks like 50% uh, here right so these are percents now we can take these two numbers and plug them into this formula uh, so percentage change in quantity is minus 100 percent percentage change in price is 50 percent uh, so it gives us two it's minus two but we're looking at the absolute value so we're getting two so remember that uh, the number for elasticity is not measured in percentages we calculate percentages in price and quantity but after we divide them by each other we just end up having a ratio so just a number no percentages there all right so that's how this formula works next thing we're going to do is to go over so-called influences uh, on elasticity and i think i'll just do a very quick review of it because I've been talking for 12 minutes already and I don't want to make it longer than 15 to be honest um, so in fact if you look in the textbook you can read about those influences here so influences on the price elasticity of demand so it talks about availability of substitutes uh, luxury versus necessities, narrowness of definition, time elapsed since price change. Also, proportion of income spend influences elasticity. And uh, that should be it. So, in fact, there is not that much to read. But um, let me at least make an outline for you about those influences. So influences on elasticity of demand so number one generally speaking more substitutes means high elasticity which makes sense of course right narrowness of category or definition it actually relates to availability of substitutes so narrow of category we are dealing with so the narrower it is the more substitutes we have so the higher is the elasticity of demand for such good so if for example you consider or compare elasticity of demand for fruit fruits versus elasticity of demand for apples then we would expect elasticity of demand for apples to be actually larger than elasticity of demand for fruit fruits because apples is a subcategory of fruits so anything else that is included in category of fruits will work as a substitute for apples 
So every time you're narrowing your category, you actually allowing for more substitutes. And every time you're actually broadening your category, you're reducing availability of substitutes. So food, which is even bigger like category, uh, will have virtually no substitutes. So we would expect elasticity of demand for food to be really low. All right, so next thing is uh, necessities versus luxuries. So necessities. Uh, so more the more necessary something is, well, the more rigid we expect demand to be. So the lower we would expect elasticity for such a good to be. So something being a necessity actually makes its elasticity lower. Something being a luxury makes its elasticity higher. Share of income. Uh, well, the higher the share of income spent on this good, the higher is elasticity of demand for this good. And uh, if you think about it, it should make sense. Remember, like if you're spending half of your income of something and then the price of this stuff doubles, then if you continue buying the same amount, you pretty much will spend all your money on this good. Probably you won't be able to do that uh, because you need to buy other stuff, right? But if something takes maybe like 5% of your income, so if price doubles, then well, you will spend 10% if not adjusting your consumption of these goods, which is still kind of acceptable. So that's like, I guess, one example to understand why it works this way. Um, and finally, time elapsed since uh, price change. Well, the more time you have, the more options you can come up with to adjust your consumption. So that means that for longer time periods, uh, we would expect the elasticity of demand to be higher. All right, so that's the end of story for now. Thank you for your time. I'm under 20 minutes, so I think it's not bad. I'll talk to you later.